subject you are doing, it depends on that particular subject. So let us uh, continue now with with this. <coughs> Some of the uh, common examples are solar and lunar eclipses. So you see here uh, eclipse of the sun and uh, all the shadow effects that are associated with the eclipse are shown here. And similarly eclipses of the moon, uh, when they occur, how do they occur, all these things are uh, uh, described uh, uh, in this particular picture and they can be elaborated further. But since you are all uh, familiar with eclipses, I won't go into uh, details, but I would, should tell you that there are some audiences in India where I have to explain this because otherwise they will continue to think eclipses are caused by Rahu and Ketu uh, and they will not come out of the house to watch it because they will be told that it is bad to do so. So, let us go to uh, next thing. Uh, one could say that the alignment of the sun, moon and the earth is required to produce the observed shadow effects. So, uh, <coughs> then you can of course ask the question, when does it occur, where does it occur and for how long does it last? So the answer to these questions came from the mathematics of motions of these heavenly bodies. This is what is history telling us. So, uh, one could ask a subsidiary question, why no solar eclipse at every new moon? If you want them in a line, if they have to come in a line with every new moon, why not? Every new moon, you have come out and you have a solar eclipse. The answer is uh, that the, uh, uh, here, uh, sorry, what is that? Let me go back. So, uh, why not solar eclipse at every new moon? Uh, so, I was a bit struck by this. <laughs> not to take chances with it. <laughs> so, but anyway, the picture that you see un underneath uh, here, uh, it shows that the, the two parts, the Sun's path around uh, around the Earth, uh, as you observe from the Earth, and the Moon's path, they are not in the same plane. So to get the right uh, configuration is not easy always. That is the point uh, to make a note. So even before knowing why and how these bodies move, the pattern of their motion was studied and understood. And so one could answer these questions with the mathematics available at that time. This is something we should uh, appreciate. So, uh, mathematics can be applied to empirical observations even before their physics is well understood. Math people have used, detected a pattern in observation and applied the mathematics to it and found that they could make predictions when that pattern will be repeated or in what form it will take. So this is uh, the point to make here. <coughs> then let us go to the Kepler's law and the law of gravitation. <coughs> the laws of Johannes Kepler were derived empirically from the pattern observed in the motions of planets based on observations of Tycho Brahe. So, the point to make here is, Tycho Brahe was an observer uh, par excellence. He was really enthusiastic about observing things and he had an excellent observatory with which to do it. And that observatory which was before telescope. I should tell you that the discovery of the telescope and its use uh, in astronomy came later. So even before that he was able to get uh, uh, observations on 
planet and make no, uh, notes about it. His problem was that he wanted to see the patterns of how planets move, but he was afraid of mathematics. He did not know how to do the mathematical analysis of his data. So he needed somebody who would be uh, happy with mathematics, comfortable with mathematics, and that was Johannes Kepler. So Johann Kepler came as an assistant of Tycho Brahe. Now Tycho Brahe was a very bad employee. He would be very rude to his assistant, and many times uh, his assistants left the job because he was so rude, so no self-respecting person would have stuck to it. But Kepler felt that this man has collected so much valuable data that I must hang on to it, even though he is very uh, rude and uh, makes my life difficult, I will bear it because of the science that is going to come out of this whole thing. So, he stuck to it. This is Tycho's uh, observatory that uh, uh, you can see uh, he has some picture of and there were all kinds of instruments but not telescopes. That is what I want to point out. So, when Kepler deduced the laws of gravitation, laws of planetary motion, those were done by the mathematical application uh, to Tycho's data. And from that he was able to show uh, that all planets move in elliptical orbits around the Sun, Sun as a focus. The area, sorry, the area swept out by the radius vector from the Sun to the planet as it moves around is uh, at a rate which is constant. That is, it sweeps out equal area in equal intervals of time. And the uh, third was the time taken to go round once depended on the size of the orbit and how big it was. He got a very simple law between uh, the time taken and the size of the orbit. So these three laws were empirically obtained by uh, uh, Johann Kepler. So here let us physics entered the field for the first time when Newton proposed his laws of motion uh, that is force equal to mass times acceleration and <coughs> he was uh, concerned with this question. What is the force on a planet that produces its observed acceleration? So Newton was asking a question in relation to Tycho Brahe's, not, not Tycho Brahe, Johann Kepler's laws of uh, planetary motion. And uh, Newton could answer that question which he had posed by saying a force towards the sun which is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of the planet from the sun. Now, I would like to make a few comments, uh, some of which may not be liked by some of the audience here, but I have to be uh, honest in towards science. Uh, it is often said that New before Newton, several other people had discovered the law of gravitation and therefore credit should go to them. One of them was Bhaskaraka. Now the point is what Bhaskaraka did was credible and was creditable also, but he could not have found this what you see here uh, that Newton has done, a force towards the sun it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance of the planet from the sun. This is a mathematical statement telling how a law of physics uh, operates. And unless somebody says this and demonstrates it by mathematics, you cannot give him credit to or law of gravity. 
So simply saying something false because the earth is attracting it, that goes to one, one uh, kind of step. You have to have climb several steps further and that has not been done by anybody uh, in, in our written history. Uh, and Newton is very rightly given the credit for it. So I would like to make this point very clear. So uh, the answer uh, that Newton got by solving this equation was by inventing a new branch of mathematics. And what was that new branch of mathematics as you see written here, calculus. The mathematical study of small and continuous changes. That, that is the definition if you like of calculus. And Newton invented calculus in order to solve the uh, problem of uh, planetary motion. Now <coughs> here one should also say that Newton was aware that calculus being a new branch of mathematics will not be trusted by the other side because they would say what is this we don't understand anything and you are the basis of it you are proving something. So what would they have understood better was uh, geometry and algebra. So he solved all those problems also by classical methods without using calculus. So that shows his versatile nature and people uh, often wonder uh, how bright Newton was. So Chandrasekhar, uh, who was, uh, who, who need not be explained, who is Chandrasekhar, I mean the astrophysicist Nobel laureate Chandrasekhar, he wrote a book on Newton's Principia and he showed that Newton's method of solving many of the problems was far superior, far more interesting than what he could think of in modern times. So this is something one should also keep in mind. So let us go further. And Newton also solved the reverse problem. That reverse problem was what is the motion of the planet like if it is acted on by a central force like this. Remember the first problem we solved was to say what was the force that made the planet go in a direction. Uh, uh, and now he is asking what is the motion of a planet like if it is acted on by a central force of the kind he had found. And he could reproduce Kepler's law of uh, motion uh, by the application of its solution. So this is something I want to uh, specify. There is another point related to all this, which in a sense in, does injustice to Newton, and that is the story of the apple falling of on him. So it is said that he sat under an apple tree and the apple fell on his head and he said, ah, gravitation. Okay. That is what the inverse square law of Earth attracting the apple. Now the point there is that it is <coughs> impossible simply by an apple dropping on you for you to conclude that it was inverse square law of gravitation. Or you can say perhaps he said the apple fell on you because the Earth was attracting you. But nothing more quantitative can be said uh, with this uh, phenomenon. Now, there is a fact, it is a fact that in Newton's garden there was an apple tree. It is a fact that under that apple tree he used to sit and think. It is also a fact that under that apple tree visitors come and he came and talked to him while he was sitting there in the garden. All these are true. But what is not true is that because the apple fell, he could immediately deduce the law of gravitation. So it requires hard work, knowing mathematics. It's not like that crank who writes saying, sorry, I don't know mathematics, but my idea is this, you, you please prove it. 
So that is not uh, happening here. Uh, and to say that Newton managed to get the answer simply by Apple calling is, is doing injustice to the hard work he himself did. So, one could say uh, in the study of planetary motion, the three components are astronomy, which gives Kepler's laws, physics, which gives laws of motion and gravitation, and mathematics, which gives differential equations, which, attempt, which are used to solve those uh, equations. So, we come to it. The problem is not complete unless all three components are known. So you, unless you had Kepler's laws, you could not do anything further. And Kepler, uh, laws of motion and gravitation were necessary to apply to Kepler's laws. And mathematics was the uh, ability to solve the equations that you have set up. So these, these three are important components. <coughs> then we come to another problem, the discovery of planet Neptune. And uh, you know that beyond the Earth, sorry, uh, beyond Saturn, uh, new planets began to be discovered, uh, in Lucas, Uranus, and then you had uh, Neptune. Now the question is, uh, if, uh, no, the question that arose was that uh, Uranus, was discovered and was being observed for uh, the study of how Kepler's laws apply to Uranus. Because it was the first planet to be discovered after Kepler had said how planets move. So naturally you feel that you have got a law uh, of motion of planets around the Sun and uh, this was derived on the basis of known planets. Now we have a new planet. Let us see if it follows that law. So when they started applying to Uranus, they found that the law of uh, uh, Newton uh, and Kepler that did not seem to be quite fitting. There was a problem. There, there is a uh, chair here. Uh, so Uranus was not following exactly what was required by Kepler so, and calculated by Newton, there was some deviation. So the question was, how do you explain that? So when this happens, uh, there are two alternative steps you can take. You can either say uh, Newton, Kepler, uh, that all that theory was wrong and we have to think again with the help of some new uh, input that Uranus is providing. Or you can say that Uranus is observed going like this, which is straying from its path. There must be some extra cause which we have not spotted, which is why it is so doing so. Uh, we still have faith in the existing laws of Newton and Kepler. So th those two things were uh, there. Uh, <coughs> So one could say in the 1800s, Neptune was not known. Irregularity was observed in the motion of Uranus. And so the uh, the question that uh, people began to, uh, should have asked, was well, is there another planet which is perturbing uh, the motion of Uranus? And if so, where is it? Now this question was asked by uh, Adams from Cambridge and later the Verrier from Paris. They were both trained mathematicians. Uh, Adams uh, was what they call senior wrangler, he taught in the mathematics examination. And he felt that he should solve this problem of that perturbing planet which is causing a deviation of the motion of Uranus. So uh, here uh, uh, you see that two young scientists, one was John 
atoms in Cambridge and the other was Alpine Library in Paris. Both of them solved the problem and both of them sent their uh, conclusions to the leading astronomers uh, in their country. First, Adams was the first to do, do it and he sent it to uh, Airy, who was the astronomer royal and also later to Chanis, who was the director of the Cambridge Observatory. So he said, please look for this new planet. They said, we'll, we'll do it in our own time. They had a pile full of, uh, sort of, pile full of uh, work to do or correspondence to answer, whatever. They did not think this was important enough investigation to make. In the meantime, Leverian also went to leading astronomers telling them to observe and uh, he did not uh, uh, <coughs> succeed. So what he did, which Adams had not done, was that he sent it to uh, a third observatory, German, German observatory, uh, this is in Berlin, and Gall was the uh, was a young astronomer observing on that day when the letter came, and <coughs> Gall said, that uh, this looks very interesting, well, let us, uh, we have the telescope here, let's go and look. And he uh, looked at it and uh, actually as pointed out by Leverian, he could find a planet there, it was Neptune. Now there is a uh, further thing to be added here, which I like to, uh, this is by the way, this data chart from which he could reduce the presence of uh, uh, Neptune and where he found it, etc. This is shown. So thus, uh, was this uh, Neptune was discovered on September 23, uh, 1846, and was the first planet found by mathematical prediction rather than by empirical observation. This is the important thing. Another important thing that I should point out was that when Leverian's letter came to the Berlin Observatory, the director of Berlin Observatory was at home celebrating his birthday. He had a birthday party on, so he was not attending the uh, office. So if he were attending the office, he would have got this letter and again put it somewhere we will do it at some later stage. But because he did, was not there and the young man was there and the young man felt this is something to do, uh, interesting, he immediately took it. So that might have been one reason and I had uh, written a short article on this uh, in Ayukal uh, Khagol thing, which was seen by uh, the director of um, uh, an Australian observatory and he put the cutting on the uh, on the board that for attention of various people saying that as as a director himself he, will, he should be aware of this kind of danger. <laughs> so uh, let us so go to the next problem. Why do the stars shine? What is the energy source for the sun that has kept it shining for uh, 5 billion years or so? So if you, this was uh, solved, at least the mathematical structure was given by Eddington who had this structure of the sun here. Uh, so you have external boundary which is visible to you and you have to deduce what is inside in terms of laws of physics. So you are having all kinds of laws of uh, physics that are known to apply for this model of the sun. So, <coughs> so the question uh, before you, uh, Eric and got it, was the question why do stars shine that generally? And the first uh, alternative people tried was that it was gravitational energy which was formed. 
and Lord Kelvin and Baron Helmholtz, one in Britain and the other in Germany, they both felt it was gravitational field, gravitational energy of the massive object which was the response. But energetics did not agree. The gravitational energy reservoir of the sun, if you use normal Newtonian gravitation, gives you the number 4 times 10 to the power 41 joules. So, uh, this is a large number, but not large enough. The sun radiates at a rate of 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. Uh, and the energy will thus last for about 10 to the 15 power 15 seconds, that is approximately 30 million years. Now you may think 30 million years is a long enough lifetime, but not for astronomers. Uh, this is only a few percent of the sun's present age, which is 5 billion years. So you have to keep the sun shining for 5 billion years, plus uh, also provide enough to for it to go on for another 5 billion years or even more. So how will you do it? That was the question. And the Kelvin and Holt hypothesis did not work because it did not provide that kind of energy. So let us see. The simple mathematics tells us that the sun has not been drawing upon its gravitational energy uh, in order to shine. <coughs> so what is the source of solar energy? So the problem was solved by Eddington, with, uh, whom you see here. Uh, Eddington's solution was that the energy comes from the atomic nuclei through a fusion reaction. And so what he did was, he, he, this reaction today in modern times is written four times hydrogen nuclei, four new hydrogen nuclei give rise to the helium nucleus two positrons, two neutrinos and some energy. So this is what uh, uh, today we interpret as what Eddington has said, but at the time Eddington said it, all these details were not known. However, uh, nuclear physicists felt that this cannot be the right answer. They said, and because what Eddington was arguing was that you have here four <laughs> nuclei of uh, hydrogen, these are positively charged nuclei. And we learned in the first lesson on electrostatics that light charges repel. So they said, you, how can you have four light charges come together and fuse when all common sense tells us that they should be repelling each other. So Eddington said, why not if they are thrown towards each other very fast, then they may get close enough for fusion. But nuclear physicists uh, did not uh, agree that this, is, this will happen and they kept uh, uh, shaking their head at this. Eddington, uh, who had the pen at his disposal, he wrote a book on stellar structure in which there is a sentence which says that we do not argue with the critic who says that stars are not hot enough for this purpose to bring them together, uh, we tell them to go and find a hotter place. So this is polite way of telling them to go to hell because the hotter place <laughs> is hell according to the Western thing. You probably in our work also will be hot. Right? Uh, so uh, Eddington uh, left it there. Subsequently, people realized that this is indeed the case. There is an attractive nuclear force of short range which comes into uh, existence whenever the two neutrons or protons are close enough. And for coming close enough, they have to be thrown at each other with great speed, which Eddington was saying. So, uh, here, uh, why do stars shine? You see here the same thing, the origin of solar energy is true. Uh, you see how these things combine and 
we, we need not go into the details of this picture, but it is telling you that uh, the problem is now completely solved. So the nuclear force is short range. Uh, the binding energy of a DTM nucleus reduces its mass to below the mass of four hydrogen nuclei and the excess mass appears as the excess energy through the Einstein equation uh, e equal to m c square. Now, probably this is the equation which is known to those who have not done any mathematics. They, they will have heard of e equal to m c square, whatever that may mean to them. But this, this is the key equation. And as you see, the total uh, age of the sun can be as high as 12 billion years using the thermonuclear uh, reservoir. So this is the first explicit demonstration of controlled thermonuclear fusion reaction, which it is happening inside the sun. And we have not yet managed to replicate this experiment on the earth. So, uh, let us go to my last one, uh, the gravitational lensing. And this was again a question asked by Newton. Does light bend under the force of gravity? Very simple question. Every light, uh, is the force of gravity attracts every piece of matter. What about light? Does it come under that category? He did not know the answer and he did not want to speculate. So he just left it uh, as a question unanswered. And it was subsequently replied by Einstein that he, he says that <coughs> bending of light by gravity is no, this is not the right way to answer. Light travels in straight lines. It is the space that becomes curved by the gravity of massive objects. So straight lines remain straight lines, but their definition changes in the sense of the space in which they are uh, going. So this, this, this is uh, in solution. And light travels in straight lines, it is the space that becomes curved. So here you see the curved space. And the mathematics of non-Euclidean geometry provides the basis for this assertion. Now I, before Einstein, uh, although mathematicians were aware of non-Euclidean geometry, they did not feel that it would, would lead to any application. Actually, if they had walked on the earth, they would have found that there is, they are living in a curved region. Here you see uh, North Pole. Uh, you come along the North Pole, go straight down uh, to equator B, uh, and then you turn left, go along the equator uh, one quarter of the way, then turn left and go again straight uh, this way. As it, they say in Marathi that Nakata you need to have a straight nose in order to go straight. <laughs> but if, what this man is doing is going by, by that definition, going straight down to equator, turning left, straight, along, and then back. So he is making a triangle with a three right angles. This is the right angle here, right angle here, and right angle here. So what was, what went wrong with the proof you had given in the geometry book? That all triangles are such that the three angles have two, uh, two right angles. Right angle. So this is something funny going on. And the answer is the geometry which gave rise to that theorem in your textbook, that geometry is not applied here. So, mathematics of non-Euclidean geometry provide the basis for this assertion. And so, the idea was that if you draw the uh, uh, line going along the sun, that the line gets bent, that is the Although you say it is bent, the line is straight, but the space is bent. So here in 1919, an eclipse of the sun confirmed the above prediction 
as <coughs> people found that if you take the sun as the bending body, that is gravitating body, light coming from behind, from a star, to, towards us, passing by the sun, but because of sun gravity it will bend and so the star will shift its image. So this was the idea that Eddington had to test Einstein's theory of gravity. Of course, you will say, how can you see a star with the sun in front of it? The answer is, you can see it during solar eclipse, total solar eclipse. And that is what he is shown here. The sun is covered like this. And you get this uh, solar eclipse. 1919 was an eclipse when it was done. And Eddington had sent two teams, one to Brazil and one to uh, Africa, where, from where they could observe the solar eclipse. And uh, he himself chose uh, the, the pre preferred position, that means which had better weather forecasting. So he went uh, to Principe and uh, the other one, other, he sent another team to Brazil. Uh, now it so happened that in Principe it rained a lot in the morning. And Eddington was getting nervous when the healthy weather was like that and again was it going to be possible to observe. But fortunately rain stopped, clouds cleared and he could do the observation. Uh, so far as the other team was concerned, they had a good weather. But they had taken a telescope which was adjusted for Oxford. From there they had uh, taken it. And it had not been adjusted for observing from the southern hemisphere. So when they uh, opened and started setting it up, they said they don't, it was not going to work. And then they readjusted it there and there was not time because the sickness was going to happen. So they had taken a small telescope and a companion telescope and they used that to make the observation. So this was the kind of status of preparation that happened and but ultimately uh, the results that he found, Eddington announced in the Royal Society and Royal Astronomical Society the joint meeting in which he proved, he, he confirmed that Einstein's prediction was wrong or right. In fact, uh, if you look at his observation, you find something fishy still because uh, there are some observations which are confirming Newton's bending of light. And Einstein's value, which was double that, is confirmed in some other observations. So he had taken only those which confirmed Einstein and seemed to have rejected Newton. I don't know why nobody has commented on it, but generally people felt that the total uh, overall experiment had to be re should have been redone and it was redone many times and now it has been done with microwave technology and it shows exact agreement with Einstein. So, although Eddington was not very uh, in that way scientific in rejecting certain data which don't agree with you, uh, he was uh, right eventually. And you see that in an uh, optical lens light is bent. So, uh, here you see this is an image, uh, this, this is an object which, which is the uh, uh, image here through a lens and it looks all curved. So this kind of thing is, is possible uh, in ordinary optical lens, uh, but a gravitational lens also produces bending of light and here you see the examples of this simulation. More dramatic examples come from modern astronomy. A single object can produce two or more images if the light rays from it uh, go to the observer along four different tracks. So you see here four a cross light structure in which four images come from one object. <coughs> so here in the 
basic diagram you are observing from here and there is that there are two poisons uh, <coughs> which are seen but actually there is one poison which would like it painting by by galaxy in between so this is the example of astronomy giving you a physical application of uh, gravitation which is mathematically calculated so the concluding everything i have say physics and mathematics are strong pillars on which the science of astronomy rests its observation also strengthens these pillars so by astronomy providing confirmation of what you are calculating and what you are assuming it helps back the physics and mathematics uh, these subjects all so it's a kind of mutual uh, aid society of the three triangle and one hopes that this uh, Co cooperation will continue for ever because problems are always there. It is not the case that uh, in your lifetime all the problems will be solved. People are, uh, all scientists are hopeful that in their lifetime most problems will be solved, but it doesn't happen. So let us hope for the best. Thank you very much. intuition in a sense of uh, that is basically in a, in a way already knowing the answer if i already know the answer it, it is helpful to draw a mathematical theory or other way around as well if i yeah, intuition can be very important and this many uh, very experienced scientists have benefited by intuition intuition doesn't mean you know precisely all answers but intuition gives you a starting point that you should think along these possibilities. But somewhere down the road, you will need mathematics and physics to guide you further. But which road to take, that intuition can be a good guide. So, can you tell me why uh, steady state theory uh, seems to be a viable explanation for the creation of the universe as of now? The steady state theory was proposed in 1948 by Boyle, Bondi, and Gold uh, as an alternative to this Big Bang theory, which says the universe started with an explosion. Steady state theory says the universe has always existed, there was no beginning and no end. Uh, but today there are certain observations which cannot be understood within the steady state framework and uh, one of the major such observations is the microwave background radiation that we find. So there are other versions of steady state cosmology which subsequently Hoyle, Perbit and I proposed for quasi steady state where we believe we can explain the microwave background and various other observations which the old steady state could not explain. Uh, Professor Nadirikat, I uh, would like to ask one question. 
uh, the steady state theory is uh, discarded because uh, the my background micro radiation is observed and it is observed to be at 3 degrees uh, absolute Kelvin. Uh, does the astronomical uh, evidence support only 3 degrees or it is a wide spectrum starting from 0 to 5 degrees or 10 degrees or it is a spike only at 3 degrees? The temperature 2.7 has been very accurately determined now. It is not the case that you have a wide range of possibilities to choose from. Our observations are not that in depth, they are very precise. If you look at the black body curve, that passes. But how does, how does it help uh, the big, big bang? Why 2.7? Why not 3 or 3.5? Yeah, you see, that is one of the weaknesses of Big Bang theory that it cannot tell you what the temperature should be. But whatever temperature you come out with, that temperature can be explained in terms of what it is. Now, then, I want to tell you one anecdote. Anecdote on the real life story. That Bondi, Gold, and Foy, they were discussing some astrophysical problem was. This was in 1955 and Bondi and Hoy were on one side and Gold was on the other side in a discussion. The discussion was about the following that if you take all the helium which you see in the galaxy or in the universe and you ask if it were made from stars, because the sun makes helium inside, so if all the starlight was connected and it was thermalized, converted into black body, you will get a 2.7 degree temperature black body uh, in, because of this conversion of starlight. So, Gold was saying that let us write a paper saying that we should see a 2.7 degree radiation background uh, in the universe. Bondi and Hoyle uh, were more cautious. They said, but we don't know how the black body was made, black body radiation was made. So uh, we will have some problem to defend. So let us simply say that radiation in infrared comes because of the solar. That was how they came out in the paper. If gold had been allowed to have its say, they would have made a prediction which in subsequent life people would have said, here the steady state people had predicted 2.7. So we should give it an important Place. But it didn't happen. That, that is where, you know, you intuition that sir was asked the question. Uh, hold at the intuition it should work. Monty and Hoyle did not. Still, the Nobel Prize would have gone to Petsias, <laughs> and gold would not have been given that. And I know that because he was talking of cosmology. And Jefferson discovered it. Yes, we are experimentalists. Always experimentalists are on the top. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. I just want to. Can you throw us some light on loop quantum gravity and how does it correlate with uh, uh, steady state theory? Which quantum gravity? Loop quantum gravity by Abhay Asteka. Abhay Asteka. Asteka. Yes. For loop. Loop, loop quantum gravity. No, I, I can't do that because it's a highly theoretical idea. Uh, and we still don't have a connection with observable effect. So it's trying to understand 
gravity both in quantum and classical level. It's not an easy job. Uh, but nobody yet knows how to quantize gravity or talk of gravity or quantum terms. But it's a useful approach and I feel it might take us somewhere uh, definitive later. Thank you. I request the head of the department, Professor Amrata Mishra, to express our thanks with a small token from the department.